Well, I conclude today the book of James. James is an interesting epistle, which means letter. And some people have looked at James down through the years and say it doesn't even belong in the Bible. It doesn't belong in the New Testament. It's just, it's kind of made a straw, they would say. It's just, it's, it's fodder. It, it's, it's not something spectacular. But I disagree. I think James is a, a very pointed, very clear book that belongs in the New Testament, belongs in the Bible as almost a counterbalance, as almost a, a way to say, let's look at the other side of the coin. Let me do a quick review of what we've learned in James so far. James is all about making choices. You choose one thing or the other. It's choice one or choice two. And, the, and, and one of the chapters is all about worry. And it's, you, you, cho- you choose in the midst of worry, you're going to flourish or you're going to wither. We've seen examples of that already this morning. The, the word that was used, the phrase that was used in, in James chapter 1 was to persevere, to persevere through trials and tribulations and hard times. James chapter 2, in some ways, was all about our works. And it's not a matter of whether we do things. It's a matter of whether we do them that are others-serving or self-serving. Because everybody does things. You got up this morning, you put on your shoes, you came to church. Like Everybody does things in life. Are you going to do things that serve other people or not? And then it, James chapter 3, really in many ways, is about the use of our Words. Are we going to choose constructive words or destructive words? The, the heading in the NIV, at least, is taming the tongue for that section of Scripture. And how are we going to take the words that we speak and make them uplifting to God and to others? James 4, in many ways, is about wisdom. Are we going to choose heavenly wisdom or earthly wisdom? James 4 says to submit to God and flee from the devil, resist the devil, and then he will flee from you. So we know that we have these choices in life. Then we come to James chapter 5, and a good piece, chunk of it is about our wealth. And that is the choice whether we're going to release our wealth or clutch onto our wealth. And you might be saying, Whew, finally, something that doesn't apply to me. It applies to those rich guys that are out there. Like, I, like finally, I catch a break at church on Sunday morning. You know, our theme for this year is to be a blessing. Say it with me. Be a blessing. And I want to remind you, by the way, that we're still keeping track. You probably have, like, slacked off on doing that, even though the 90 days of Pentecost has ended. We are going to hit 10,000 this year, so... Go back, go to that website, go, go find it on the app, put in the things you've done since you've done it last, and let's, let's see how we can do together. We're like at 8,000 or something like that already. I, I don't even know. I haven't looked for a long, long time. But I'm going to say, let's continue to be a blessing, including with our wealth. There was an old man who was on his deathbed. His wife came in, and as always, she was there at his bedside. She was serving him. She was caring for him. And she said, I I just need to know, is there anything that you need me to do for you? And he said, yes, there is. I want you to reach into the back of my closet and pull out a shoebox. So she went digging through his closet, went into the very back of it, found a shoebox, and brought it to him. There he is on his deathbed, and he said, take the lid off. She took the lid off, and the box was filled with $100 bills, just filled with $100 bills. She said, what's this? All these years that we've been married, we've scrimped, and we've struggled, we've tried to get by, and here you have a box full of $100 bills. What is this? He said, well, I worked hard. I worked hard and I provided for the family. We didn't have much, but we had. We didn't save much, but except this. And I've squirreled it away and this is my money. She said, is that so? He said, I need you to make me a commitment that when I die, you will bury me with this money. She thought about it. She thought about her vows that she had made. And she said, okay, I'll do it. 
A few days later, he died. They were at the funeral, and there was the casket. And just as the service was ending and they were getting ready to close the casket, she came out of the front row. She came up. She took the box. She played on, placed it on his chest, and they closed the casket. She went back and sat down, and her, her best friend was sitting next to her. And she said, I can't believe that after all these years that you gave that miser his money. What were you thinking? She looked back at her friend and she said, don't worry about it. I deposited the money in my bank account. I wrote him a check. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Money, man. Makes the world go around and makes the world go down, doesn't it? Money. You know, when, when James speaks about money, he's speaking to a group of, of Jewish Christians who had been dispersed out of Israel. It's, a, it's an era that was known as the diaspora. And they had been forced to live and, or had chosen sometimes to live in these other places. And in, around the area of modern day Turkey is the group of churches he was writing to. And these Jewish people had converted to Christianity or actually realized the fullness of Judaism with the Messiah and had become believers in Jesus Christ. So they, they weren't necessarily what you would call the wealthiest people in the world, though they had some means. They, they, seem to be doing okay. And so when he speaks to them about the topic of wealth, he's speaking a very common language to all kinds of people. Now, I want to, I want to think about, you think about this. If you were to Google the world's wealthiest people, do you know what you'd find? Well, I did it, and here's what you'd find. Don't worry about not being able to read it. I made it as big as I could for the screen. But here's here's a screenshot of what you'd find. There's the world's wealthiest people, ranked by name, by net worth, by age, by their country, and their source of their income. You know, by the way, if you use your computer to do a Google search, to order something from Amazon, and then post it, what your purchase was on Facebook, You have just made richer Bill Gates, Larry Page, Jeff Bezos, and Mark Zuckerberg, four of the eight wealthiest people in the world. We're doing it every day. In fact, if you click on one of the names, just click on the top name, there you see Jeff Bezos, and you get his picture and a little bio information, and he's looking sharp, and he's got a pithy quote, and he's, he's ranked number one on the right-hand side. Number one, number one, number one, number one, world's wealthiest, world, world's best. And my question becomes, how much is enough? Like, what do you do when, with your money when you have enough cars and enough homes and enough things and you can't possibly find a way to spend any more? And I think we now know the answer. You build a personal spaceship and fly yourself (laughs) to the moon. (laughs) So, So the question becomes, what does it take to be rich? I mean, certainly James would have been writing to this guy, right? So what does it take to be rich? I mean, is it like, does it require us to be in the the top 1% of the wealthiest people in the world or the top 5% or the top 10%? I mean, to whom was James writing? And so let's take a look at this. And and I just took out some of my old math skills and made a little chart here for us all to take a look at. The world's what it means, what does it take to be among the world's wealthiest? And let's look at an annual income of a million dollars a year and $250,000 a year. And 100, this is a family of four, $100,000 a year, but which by the way, $100,000 of household income is the median income for Hamilton County. And $50,000 a year, half of the median income for Hamilton County. For a family of four, for a family of four. And so if, if you make a million dollars per year, you're in the top 1% of all the people in the world. 
it, it, way beyond 1%. And if you make $250,000 a year, you're still in the top 1% of all the wealthiest people in the world. And if you make the media, if your household makes the median income of $100,000, $100,000, you're in the top 3% of all the people in the world. And if you make a measly $50,000 as a family of four, not as an individual, but as a family of four, you're in the top 10% of all the wealthiest people in the world. Here is the deal. When the Bible talks about the wealthy, it means me. Say that phrase with me. It means me. Say it like you believe it. It means me. James is talking to us. So we can't get off by pointing a finger at the Forbes top 50 list and say, it's those guys. That's not what James is talking about. That's not the people he's talking to. He wasn't talking to the Caesar when he wrote the letter. He wasn't talking to the Roman Senate when he wrote that. He was talking to people like us. It means us. By the way, did you know if you Google, instead of the world's wealthiest people, the world's poorest people, you'll get no names, no net worth, no nothing except for a bunch of statistics about South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. That's all, that's all you get. Pretty boring information. None of them, the world's poorest people, none of them will ever travel into space. Almost none of them will ever board a jet. Almost none of them will ever own a Tesla. Almost none of them will ever order anything from Amazon because they'll never see a computer. It is so tempting for us to stand back and look at the rest of the world and say, well, they have the problem. They're the ones. If only they shared. If only if only the top 10 list would start coming to Fishers United Methodist Church and heard one fantastic sermon on be a blessing, all our problems would be solved. Misses the point of James, doesn't it? Misses it big time. In fact, if we want to take a look at James' word to the rich, that's us, we've agreed, then let's take a look at a few, a few truths. I have five or six of them here. One of those is that money won't save you. It won't do it. <laughs> you, you, like you might get buried with the box and it might have cash on your chest. It won't get you into heaven. I mean, as far as I know, the streets of heaven are paved with gold, but you don't get to chip away a bar or two of it and put it in your tent when you get there. Here's what James says about it. And it's all through the book of James, by the way. It's not just in chapter five. Here's what James says about it. He, he's talking about a, somebody coming into the, the meeting, that is to the church, wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor guy coming in with old stinky clothes. And he says this, if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you stand here. By the way, they didn't have chairs for most people. You stand there, or you go sit at the, on the, at the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? He goes on to say in this, in verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convinced by the law as lawbreakers. If you show favoritism to people because they have resources, then you're as guilty of the biblical law as a murderer or a thief. Ouch. A second truth that James points out to us is this, and that, that's favoritism is fool's gold. You, you, can't just, you can't just like love on people because of that. He extends the idea even further. Now, now we come to the actual scripture that I had up there. If you show, you know, when the notes are here and the screen's there, I'm sorry. If you show that favoritism, you're in lots 
of trouble. Third thing is this, that resources are a source of grace. This comes to our theme for this year. By now, I hope you figured it out. That our theme for this year is our theme for this decade, be a blessing. It's our theme for our life to be a blessing, that God has resourced us in such a way that everything that we have, everything we receive, everything that is ours is really God's. It it really is his. You know, there's, there's no particular reason that you were born into a family or born into a situation or born into a country that allowed you to accumulate what you have. No particular reason. I mean, what if it were flipped and Africa was the wealthiest continent in the world and the Americas were the poorest continent in the world and you had been born here? You too, like they, would have been living in a mud hut. It's just the way it is. You'd have been uneducated, you'd have been poor, you would have traveled long distances for water. You would, have, you would have prayed that a mosquito would not bite you so that you wouldn't die that night. To understand that, that the resources we have are the source of grace that we have for other people in the world. Now let's go to James chapter 2. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. And if one of you says to that person, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Who cares? I mean, if if we hear say, yeah, we've got a food pantry, it's really awesome, you can't come. Yeah, we we gather up these resources, we, we got these things, you can't have them. I have these blessings from God. God's poured them into my life. Sorry, they're for me and me alone or my family because my family is my priority. James is uh, pulling no punches as he winds up his little letter to us. It goes on, and the fourth thing would be this, and that is our prayers actually reveal our hearts. We saw, we saw this real recently, and by the way, just I'm going to say it, by the way, Ben's sermon last week was explosively good. If you haven't watched it, go watch it and prepare to be shaken to your core. And, and he, he taught us about this, this concept that we're looking at here and now that, about our prayers and how they reveal our hearts. And, and it, James simply says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Here's a, here's a newsflash. It's not about you. Y- your life. Your resources, your wealth, your spiritual gifts, they're not about you. They're about him. They're always about our great God who has given us everything that we have, every good gift that we have. They're they're always about him. And when they, when they, they cease being about him. They don't cease being about him. But when, he, when they divert from that, he says, it's about others. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as you love yourself. You already love yourself. James is, is reminding us that all that we have belongs to him. So when we pray, here's a dangerous prayer. God, you know my bank account. You know my tax forms. You know my net worth. You know the value of my home. You know the newness of my car. You, you, like God, just speak the words. Like God, you know these things. Lord, I place it in your hands. What would you ask me to do with it? 
James goes on here, and the fifth thing out of six of them, he says, you can't take it with you. You, you just can't. It's just, it's never a good idea. You know, a, a hearse pulling a U-Haul because you think you can take it with you is just a dumb thing to do. <laughs> Build one of those big house things that you get buried in so you can stuff all your stuff in there with it. That's just a, that's just a bad thing to do. But, but we're good at thinking that everything we have is ours. And, and we, we end up wanting to, to die with, with so much resources that we can give it to our children who by that age are probably in their 60s. And my thought is this. If my kids haven't figured out how to make it by the time they're in their 60s, it stinks to be them. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. It's like, really? <laughs> you're like, you're banking on something from me? You haven't figured it out yet? All they poured into you? I'm crying out loud to take you to college. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you gotta be able to figure this out. We have this, this mindset that we can take it or, or that we can like keep our family, like, uh, fine, put, you know, put your kids in your will. Our kids are, are in our will. I mean, they, yeah, they are. But like, like, what about generosity? What about a different kind of thinking? But by the way, by and by, like, we are right now in the final stages of revising a new endowment policy for this church. And we've been working on it for, for a long period of time. The, the council now has it. We're going to be finishing it up. My hope is by this fall or the end of this year, it will be done. Maybe it's time to, to meet with your attorney and um, redo your will. I'm not saying give 100% to the church. You know, 50%. I, I don't know. You, you figure that out. That's, that's between you and God. All I'm saying is like, you know, you're not going to take it. You're not taking it. And, and let me tell you, I've done a whole lot of funerals. Those super fancy, wealthy caskets go in the ground the same way the cheap wooden ones do. They, go, they all get dropped in the same way with cheap, dirty straps. I've, I've been to a whole lot of them. <laughs> it, it all looks the same. You, you choose. Dang, gone it, James. It's his fault, not mine. It's like, James, I'm glad I'm not named James. It says, now listen, you rich people, and remember who the rich people are? Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Won't do you much good. The final thing is this. Possessions can possess us. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? Look, the wages you failed to pay, the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You know, you translate this as you want. You may not have a field that needs harvested, but you may have, you know, a pizza you ordered and didn't tip on or whatever. You figure it out. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Okay, let me, let me take this, this, this is nothing new, right, today. Let me just take this and, and make it real. What if, what if you drew a line, just somewhere, you, you figure out where the line is, and you drew a line and said, this is my line of contentment. And everything above this is more than I need. And everything, everything beyond it, I'm going to find a way to be gracious to others with. What, what if you, we changed our way of thinking? Here, here's one of the, the real problems that I see in this whole concept of tithing. T-I-T-H-E, the word tithe. It literally means tenth. And the, and the idea of the biblical tithe, of the biblical tenth, we look at that thing like it's the top of the ceiling. Like the, the normal Christians give zero, one, two, three percent of all of their, their income, their wealth, to the, to the work of the church, and someday, some people, a few, might reach a tithe, and that's the ceiling, that's the hope, that's the dream, that's the someday. We have it completely backwards. The tithe is the floor. The ceiling 
is the 100%. Which is why Jesus, when he saw the widow putting her little bitty coin that was all she had in, he said, now that's how you do it. It's all she had, it's 100%. Again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, you know, go home, sell your house, live in a pup tent and bring all the, all the proceeds back to the church. That's not the point. The point is for you to figure out what's the line of contentment where you would say, like, I have enough. God has blessed me. And beyond this is, is more than I truly need or even desire to live by. Let me just tell you a few stories as I to, to take away stories of people that, he, that I know or know of. Some, some of these I know directly. Um, they're, they're true stories of people who've made decisions in their life. There's a young couple who was giving about 3% of their, their income to the life of their church. And they knew the Bible taught tithing, giving a tenth. So they decided to jump their giving by 2 to 3% every year until it got to 10% and then reevaluate at that point. There was an older couple who was already giving a tithe. They were giving 10%. And they decided, they looked at each other and they prayed about it, and they decided to increase their giving substantially, even though they were already giving a tithe. Third one out of four of these. There was a young single woman who was giving 10% of her, her income. She was young and single, by the way. 10% of her income in 2010. And the Lord convicted her to increase her giving by 1% every year. So in 2011, 11%. 2012, 12%. I'm assuming that if she's still staying true to that, this year she's giving 21%. She was young. She was hoping to live to 2099 so that she could bless God back with 99% of all that she'd be receiving at that point in her life. Wow. And there's a man who was very wealthy and he decided to reverse tithe because he drew a line and he decided to give 90% and live on 10%. And though he had the resources, he decided not to buy a beach home and, do, and things. I don't care if you have things like that. I just don't care. But for his life, he decided, you know, I just don't need these extra things. And so he, he gave away 90% and lived on 10%. Here, here's the point. There's not a formula. There, there's not a, uh, here's the right way to do it, and you're a real Christian. If you do these things, that you're biblical, or if you do these, you've satisfied the book of James. No, that misses it. That's super legalistic. The point is for all of us to examine ourselves and realize that we have abundant blessings, enormous blessings in our lives. And God has, God has given us Truly, more than we could ask or imagine. He, he's just poured it out. And, and, we, and we, we don't notice it because we live in a, an environment in which sort of everybody has, everybody does. Everybody? What if what we have and what we're given and what, what we receive what we've earned, what we've worked hard for. I'm not minimizing that. What we've risked, what we've been educated for, what we put 40 or 50 years of work in. What if all of those things are what God's wanted us to do so that we could be an incredible blessing to the world around us? You know, a church's a church which has giving problems, it's never money problems, ever. It's heart problems, faith problems, generosity problems. It's never about income. A, a, a family that is struggling financially. There are times when, when reality hits and husband and wife both lose their job and, and and just they're down. But the majority of cases that I see are just upside down with the way we approach money and borrowing and they got to have the, the new thing. What's being offered even now 
through Greg Arnett and others in this church on generosity, I encourage you to be part of that and, and to ask yourself, where's my line? Is my line here? Is my line here? Is my line here? Like, where is my line? Where beyond that, I don't really need to build my personal rocket ship and fly to the moon to be happy in life. Where's the spot for me where I say, I'm content? Thank you, Lord. God, we've dealt with a hard topic today. It does seem like that I can uh, preach about sin and hell and damnation and salvation and the cross and crucifixion and everybody will say, you know, great job. But talk about money and um, people wish they'd worn their steel-toed boots to church. So, so God, I, I just offer this to you because it's important enough for you for it to appear in the Bible in fact, it's not simply in the book of James. It's all throughout Scripture. Someone has said that, that teachings on money in the Bible are more common than teachings on faith. I imagine, God, that's because you have said this, that where our treasure is, where our money is, that's where you'll find our heart. And you want our hearts. So here and now, we offer ourselves to you. Not simply our prayers and our faith and our souls. But we offer you our bodies, our resources, our wealth. And we say, take my life. And let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.